Uh, like I was saying, I'm a front-end engineer at M Pharma. At M Pharma, we're on the mission to provide uh, accessible and affordable healthcare to everyone in Africa. And you can check out some of the stuff that I have on the interwebs, on GitHub, on YouTube, and my Medium blog. So I'd like to set expectations early on before I start, uh, so you can decide if you want to listen to me or probably go on Twitter. So this talk is about my experience as a front-end engineer building an audio to text app in Python with no um, prior experience in Python. So I really appreciate learning. I've been coding Python now for about three months and uh, it's really an honor to be here and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. That being said, uh, I really appreciate learning. So if you see anything that you think, uh, any feedback you have for me, please let me know and just grab me afterwards and we'll have a quick chat. So let me give you a brief history of my dance with Python. Uh, my first encounter with Python was in 2012, 2013. I was coming from languages like C++ and Java, which, if you know, are bra braces heavy. And um, at the time, I was using uh, editors like Notepad++, which didn't really have auto-formatting capabilities. So with the indentation style of Python, I, it bore, like, it, really annoyed me, and I, after a few days, I quit. And then, seven, fast forward seven years, as developers, it is our duty to keep learning. So at the beginning of the year, so at the beginning of the year, uh, I wanted to learn a new language. So I, I had narrowed down my search to Clojure and Python. I decided to go with Python because of all the use cases that are privy to the language, and I have a lot of human resources around me. At M Pharma, we are heavily invested in Python, so it made more sense for me to take on Python at this time, so I did. A few weeks after I started learning Python, my mom calls me and asks me, my mom is an author and a speaker, so she calls me and asks me if, how she can get the content from her speaking engagement to use in her books. And a light bulb went off in my head and I knew I could build it in Python. So I built Damaris. Damaris is a Python app that transcribes audio files to text. Damaris works with two inputs. It works with the audio file you want to transcribe and the email address of, the email address that you want the transcription to be sent to. And I'll talk about my decision for using the email address later on. So I'd like to talk about my approach. I'm a front-end engineer. This is my first time coding anything in Python. This is my first Python project. Uh, as a front-end engineer, the first thing, the first, the first point of contact when you are, when you want to communicate with an API is to read documentation. So I decided to go with documentation driven development. Documentation driven development or read me driven development simply means write your read me first. So this enabled me to think through the API, to think through the arguments that I wanted it to take and then the, in, the output that I wanted to give. So this is a, oh, it's not visible. This is the basic, uh, my first draft. So I have the definitions, the description, the arguments I wanted to take, which is an audio file, which at this time must be MP3, and the email address that I want to send to. After thinking about the structure, after thinking about, after planning it, the next step is implementation. So I decided to employ the use of a few technologies. The first was Flask. I know most of us know what Flask is here, but for the benefit of those who don't know, Flask is a micro web framework for Python. It's really simple, uh, it implements the barest minimum, and it allows you, it provides you with a very, very simple web API interface that enables you to build web apps quickly. Second technology I decided to employ was Docker. Um, Docker is a software platform that enables you to build, test, and deploy your applications quickly. And I wanted to use this because I didn't want to litter my computer with a lot of Python packages and different Python versions. Uh, I tend to containerize all the applications that I built, so, and it gives you a consistent development environment. You can always go from a Mac to a Windows machine or a Linux machine and still be up and running in no time. And the third technology I decided to employ was the Google's Cloud Speech-to-Text API. 
frankly, because it's the only making sense API out there, speech to text API out there. And um, there's great documentation, and it's Google. So, before I show you some code, I'd like to walk through a basic flowchart of what the application looks like. So we have the transcribe audio endpoint, and then we have a health check. We'll talk about that later. Uh, apart from the health check, we have the request. So the first thing is we want to check if the audio file is valid. If it's not valid, we'll send the appropriate error response. If it is valid, we'll move on to check if the email is valid. If it's not valid, we'll send an error response. If it's valid, then we'll go to the cost of the application which is we'll convert from MP3 to WAV. I'll talk about that in depth in a bit. And then we'll check the length of the file. If it's less than 60 seconds, we take a different approach from if it's, less than, if it's greater than 60 seconds. So if it's less than 60 seconds, we'll transcribe the file synchronously and then send the results as an email. And that's the end of the program. If it's greater than 60 seconds, we we'll upload to Google, um, Google Cloud Storage first then we'll transcribe the file asynchronously uh, using the Google Cloud Storage URI. Then we'll send the results as an email, and that's the end of the program. So this is just the basic flowchart of what the application does. So let's look at some code now. Ah, this is not visible at all. OK. We're going to look at it chunk by chunk. Oh, it's fine. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to look at it chunk by chunk anyway, so it's fine. All right, uh, we'll continue like that. So the first thing is the health check. Um, what is a health check? Health check is simply a way to know if your API is alive to receive requests or not. And it's, it, it's a very good practice for every API we build to have health checks. And these days, modern infrastructures tie into your health check to know whether to spin up instances or to tear down functioning instances. So it's always a good rule of thumb to always incorporate um, health checks in every API that we build. So for this one, we just have a basic health check that says on the get request, if everything is OK, return it 200 OK. That's all. After fleshing out the health check, the next step is validation. We have uh, client-side validation, and we have server-side validation. For client-side validation, this just provides a great user experience. But uh, server-side validation is where the juice is actually at. So for here, and, and there's this rule of thumb that says, never trust user input. I take that very seriously. So for here, all we're just trying to do is check if the audio file and the email address is present. If those two things are not present, then we return uh, the correct status code and a sensible error message. Now, this is very important because as a front-end engineer, I've worked with APIs that something is obviously wrong. It's a 400 bad request, but you see a 200 OK. That doesn't make any sense to me. And there's some times where you also have the scenario where um, there, is an, there is the status code, but there's no message. There's no sensible message to help you who is consuming the API move faster. So it's, it's a good um, practice to always be intentional about the status codes that we return and the messages as well. So we'll move to the second phase of the validation. After checking that the audio file and the email address is present, we also have to check the audio file, make sure that it is what we expect. Somebody can send you a JPEG file and say that that's what they want to transcribe. That will crush our program. So that we have to also check and make sure that um, files like that are not allowed in our system. So here we just check that the file is valid. If it's not valid, um, we return with the error message and the status code. We'll do the same thing for the email as well. We'll try to validate the email and check if it is according, if it's, um, according to the standard email format. If it isn't, 
we'll do the same thing. We return the status code 400, signifying as a bad request, and we return a sensible error message. So if our program is still running at this point, it means that we've gone through all the checks and everything is okay. So we'll go to the main part of the application, which is transcribing the audio file. So the beginning, if you can remember from the flow chart, after the validations are done, we come to the main part of the application, which is um, converting from MP3 to WAV. And this is because according to the Google API, the Google Speech to Text API, it says that uh, for optimal results, you should use a lossless codec. Lossless codec is like a FLAC or a linear 16. And a linear 16 is the codec for a WAV file. And if you, if you do not have access to uh, a lossless codec, then it's only a lossy codec you have. A lossy codec is like MP3, MP4, M4As. Then you can transcode from a, lossless, from a lossy codec to a lossless codec. So that's what we're just doing here. Or converting from MP3 to WAV, so from a lossy codec to a lossless codec. Then we check the duration of the file, and then based on the duration, we do something different. So if the duration is less than 60 seconds, we take a different approach. We want to transcribe the file locally. The first thing, so we have a transcribe class, and then this is a method on the transcribe class. So what we want to do is we want to read the contents of the file. If you read the contents of the file, it's if you read the content of an audio file, it is binary. So we want to read the binary content of the file, pass it to the recognition audio. The recognition audio comes from the speech-to-text API library. And then we'll also set up the config. Then when we're done, we can pass the config and the audio to the recognize function. That also comes from the speech-to-text API. Then this function synchronously transcribes the file and gives us the response, and we save it in the variable response. Then when we're done with that, we can try to loop through, we we'll loop through and then write it to the file. I'm so sorry, this is not visible at all. And we we'll try to write it to the file. Then when we're done with that, after we're, we're done creating the file, we can send the email. Now, if the duration is greater than 60 seconds, we want to take a different approach. The first thing we have to do is upload to Google Cloud Storage. So this is as simple as um, just the scripts. We get the client, we get the storage client, we get the bucket on the client, we create a blob on that bucket, then we upload the file that we want to, the WAV file that we have, we upload it to the blob, and then every Google Cloud Storage URI follows this format, so we can interpolate it and then get the URI and return it. Then one wants to transcribe a remote file. It's almost the same thing as transcribing a local file. So the only difference is this time around, instead of reading the contents of the file, we pass in the Google Cloud Storage URI. So you can see the types dot recognition audio. We pass in the URI instead of content. And then after that, we construct the config again. Now, just a side note: um, you can use the FFmpeg library. I think it comes with Mac and Linux. I'm not sure about Windows, but you can also always use it to uh, inspect the headers of any audio file. So the for, for the 4,100 I have there, the audio channel count, the encoding, I did not pull it out of my head. So I just, um, you can inspect the headers of any audio file. You can inspect the headers of MP3, MP4, WAV, and then you see different values, and then you can use them there. Then after doing that, this time around, instead of calling, the first time we called a client the recognize function. But this time around, we call a client the long running recognize with the same parameters. And what this does is it's, it sets up a job, Google sets up uh, a job to do this asynchronously. The first time we were transcribing it synchronously, this time it's asynchronous. Then we get the results again, we loop over it and write it to a file. Then when we're done, we can send the email successfully. Now, this is a good point for me to talk about the reason why I decided to use the email instead of other than the normal way that I was thinking about it. Normal way I was thinking about it is like, if a user is on the web page and the user uploads the um, audio file that they want to transcribe, they have to wait and then when it's ready, they can download it. But that didn't make much sense for me 
user experience perspective. So we decided to use the email address so that if the user uploads the file that they want to transcribe, they can forget about it. And whenever it's ready, whenever the transcription is ready, it will be sent to their email. And then it can also serve as a storage vehicle because if you have it in your email, you always have it, except you delete it yourself. So let's look at the send email function. So the first thing you'll notice is there is no self. This, e this send email function is not part of the transcribe class because it has nothing to do with transcription per se. So it's just a function on its own. And then I use the send grid API to help me out with this. So the first thing, let's think about it. The first thing is you want to create an email and then you want to attach the transcription to it. So here we just create uh, a mail object from the mail class. And we pass in the email that I want it to come from, the email we want to send to, the subject, and the plain text content. Then we read the, um, we read the file, we read the binary file, the file that we have created. But there's a caveat. When you want to attach a file, to an email, you have to base64 encode it. So that's what we do here on the second line. We try to encode it. And then we want to create the attachment object from the attachment class. After doing that, we, we uh, add the file content, which is what we just encoded, the file type, and then the file name. Then we attach the attachment to the mail. I know. So when we're done with that, we'll try to send the email. If it works successfully, we'll log that. It's Good. If it doesn't work, we log that there was a problem. This is how it looks like. I don't know if it's visible, but then um, we have the text, the plain text that we uh, specified. We have the subject, we have the email address it's coming from, and then we have the transcription attached. Now, I don't know, uh, if you were paying attention, you'll see logs littered everywhere. And this is for the simple fact that one does not simply write perfect software. You can never write perfect software. And no matter how much you try, software will always break at some point. So it's always a good idea to leave breadcrumbs for yourself. And we do this by, um, you can use print statements to do this. So every action that goes through, you write a print statement. But Python has um, provided the login module. So I use that. So I create a function called the logger. I specify the log format in which I want all my logs to come in. I specify the file where I want all my logs to be aggregated. And then I have a basic config where I set up everything. This, is, this comes with Python. And then I use this log everywhere in every action that happens in my system. And then this just enables me to know in case there's any problem. Because like I said, you can never write perfect software. So in case there's any problem, I can always go back, infer the log file, and then see where there was a problem. So you can always check out the full project on my GitHub account. Um, I have uh, set up the readme. There's a readme there, and there's instructions on how to set this up for yourself. So if you want to, if you see anything that could be made better, please send a PR. I'm just learning, like I said, I'm a beginner in Python. So if you see anything that you think could be made better, please let me know. Send a PR, I'll be more than happy to review it and let you know and maybe merge it. Um, before I wrap up, I'd like to talk about M Pharma for a bit. We're hiring at M Pharma. And M Pharma is in Ghana and we're also in Lagos, Nigeria. We have offices in Ghana and Lagos. We have offices as well in Zambia and Zimbabwe. So if you'd like to join, um, we have roles open for software, um, for front-end engineers, for back-end engineers, and for DevOps engineers. So if you'd like to work in a very inclusive environment, uh, we'd love to have you. Our mission, like I said at the beginning, is to provide accessible and affordable healthcare to everyone in Africa. So please, you can go to the link, mpharma.com slash careers. And in the words of our CEO, we're building an Africa that's in good, good health. So um, thank you to my friends, 
Nobody learned how to code alone. And I had friends, I had uh, support from my guys. Selassie, Larry, Boo Boo, and Bob. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for all your help. And thank you all for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much for, for that. Thank you to your mother for having the problem in the first place because that's the most, that's where these things come from. That was really interesting and inspiring and I, I want to try that out. So we have just a couple of minutes because we're going to have our keynote with Anna soon, but I'm sure there must be some questions for uh, Chamaka. So please raise your hand and I'll, we'll find a microphone for you. So my question is, uh, was it deployed and in what form is it a web app or a mobile app? No, it hasn't been deployed yet, but it's going to be uh, not in a web form, API. So I'm going to build a front-end application. I'm a front-end engineer. So I'm going to build a front-end application to consume this API. But for now, it's, I, use it for, I use it to transcribe files for my mom locally. So as, as a first-time project in Python, this is fantastic. Um, Thank you. So, uh, I started uh, this project in June. That's when I started learning in Python. June. And, and how long have you been a front end engineer? For about three, four years. Three, four years? Okay, yeah, you, you come across with a lot more experience than that. So, well, well done. Thank you. And thank you. It's really such a pleasure to see people sharing their inventions with us. So, thank you. I hope you found it really inspiring as well. Thank you. Thank you.